that come from only using one eye. And I wish I had a better demonstration than this, but does anyone have any idea what this is, this picture here? Going to a 3D movie? How many of you have gone to 3D movies? Do you see the 3D? It's incredibly cool. I see it now, I'm sort of hooked on 3D movies. I didn't, up, well, that's part of my story. Or some of you have probably looked through these toy stereo viewers and you see things in 3D. Seeing in 3D is called stereopsis. That's the mechanism, S-T-E-R-E-O-P-S-I-S, stereopsis. And for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about stereopsis or stereo vision. And what I mean is the kind of 3D vision that people have that can you can only have if you are merging the information coming from the two eyes. So if you are strabismic and you're not merging the information from the two eyes, you're suppressing one eye or the other, you do not have 3D vision. And in fact, about 5% of the population does not have stereopsis, does not have stereo vision. And with the rest of the population, some people have much better stereo vision than others. There's a long continuum, okay? Well, I didn't have stereo vision, and I knew this. And I also believed that there was no way in the world that I would ever gain stereo vision. Why? Because when I was in college, my junior year in college, I took a neurobiology course, and I learned that there was a critical period for the development of stereo vision that occurs probably within the first two years of life. If your eyes are misaligned and you're not getting correlated input during those first two years, you, your window for the development of binocular vision has closed and you will never develop binocular vision. Your brain cannot rewire itself anymore for binocular vision. Your brain has wired itself for a monocular way of viewing and that's it. No change is allowed. End of story. And that's, I remember learning that. I, you know, I was in class and I'd taken lots of lectures and I'd gotten into this habit of being able to take notes without really listening. And all of a sudden, the professor starts talking about cats that were made strabismic, little kittens, and how they didn't have binocular vision. And I looked up and was like, what? I'm strabismic? I mean, my eyes look normal now because I had had three surgeries. And I thought I saw normally. I looked good. Well, uh, that's up for somebody else to judge. But I mean, I looked normal. <laughs> and um, I didn't wear glasses. I had 20-20 vision at that time. My brother and sister have been wearing glasses since grade school, so I always figured I had the better vision. And all of a sudden I'm learning, there's a way of seeing I don't have. I don't have this thing called stereopsis. Or I, you know, and I went and I tried every stereo vision test I could find, and I flunked them all. No eye doctor had even mentioned this to me. And then when I went back to my ophthalmologist, he said, no, you don't have, let me take out the test. And he tested me and he said, no, you have no binocular vision whatsoever. You only use one eye or the other. But don't worry about it. Stereo vision is just a little fine tuning, just frosting on the cake for the visual system. And then he said, you don't need binocular vision because you don't have it. Because logic <laughs> kind of escaped me, but OK, no use crying over spilt milk. I had long since passed the critical period for the development of binocular vision. I was doing fine. And just, you know, move on, you know? But then in my early 40s, new problems arose. When I would look in the distance, everything would jitter. I couldn't drive a car and read a road sign at the same time. The road sign would be jittery. My children, when they would be up, up on a stage giving a performance, and I was in the high school auditorium, which isn't that big, um, if I'm sitting in the middle of the auditorium, their faces were a blur. And it was hard to keep my vision to keep my gaze focused in a distance. If I drove down a straight road, when we lived in Texas, when my husband was in NASA, there were all these straight roads there. Um, unlike Massachusetts, where nothing is straight. Um, um, I, uh, if I would look in the distance, it was like the road would grain out. And I was constantly shaking my head to get the image back in there. So to make a long story short, I went to see a developmental optometrist because these are the eye doctors who are most interested in day-to-day -day functional vision and binocular vision. And um, she explained to me what was going on. What she told me was that I switched attention from one eye to the other, which I didn't even know. I knew you know, that I had a sort of monocular view of the world, but I didn't really know why. And she said, because my eyes were still misaligned, 
um, I was getting two different views of the world. And so especially when I was looking at the distance, within a second I might get right eye view, left eye view, right eye view, and so on. And that's what was causing the jitteriness. Okay? And she said, what we need to do, what my goal for you is, is to stabilize your gaze. Make it so you can look in the distance. The two eyes sort of point in the same direction, so your gaze will be nice and stable, and the jitteriness will go away. And I said, that sounds great to me. So why would my eyes still misalign? Because when you go through surgery, they align your eyes so that they cosmetically look pretty straight, but they're actually, I was still off. The two eyes were still um, crossed, and they still did not see. When I looked at something, I, the two eyes did not both focus on the same thing, uh, or the two eyes were not directed at the same target at the same time. And this was worse for near than far. But I still was cross-eyed. And I also had a vertical mismatch between my two eyes. So my right eye saw several degrees below my left, which is one of the reasons why things were so jittery. So my eye doctor, my optometrist, gave me a prism for the right eyeglass lens that vertically shifted the visual world for the right eye to make it more in line with the left. And I remember that when she did that, she did it on what's called uh, a ferometer, I think is the, the way they use the word. It's, you know, that big thing that they put in front of your face and they switch lenses and they say, which is better, one or two? You know, that thing. And she put in the prism and she said, look at the eye chart. Does it look any different? And I said, yes. And she said, why? I said, because the letters are not jittering so much. I can read the chart better because they're not jittering. And I was ready to walk out of the office with that gadget. Like, just give it to me. You know, this is so restful. This is so nice. But I had to wait a few weeks to get my eyeglasses with the prison ground into them. The other thing she did was start me on a program of optometric vision therapy. The point of the therapy was to get me to direct both eyes at the same point at the same time. And as you'll see in, by the end of the talk, having the two eyes looking at the same point at the same time was absolutely critical. And she said to me, I know I can get you to the point where your gaze will be stable. I don't know if you'll ever gain any stereo vision, any stereopsis. I, you know, she said, you're a post-surgical middle-aged esotrope, alternating esotrope. <laughs> Very flattering, post-surgical middle-aged alternating esotrope. But your prognosis isn't so good, but I know I can get your gaze stable, and you'll be able to drive at night and see your kids on the auditorium stage and so on. So she started me on vision therapy, 